It is my great pleasure to call upon Lloyd Carney for our commencement address. Mr. Carney is the Chief Executive Officer and a member of the Board of Directors of Brocade Communications and one of our own alumni. Mr. Carney. Thank you so much. Um, first, I want to congratulate the Wentworth class of 2013. Great job. And also, the parents, you've been congratulated before, but as a parent, you can never be congratulated enough. So congratulations to the parents once again. And last but not least, congratulations to the staff and the faculty of the wonderful institution, which is Wentworth Institute of Technology. An institution which I'm proud to call my alma mater. You have taken yet another cast of young men and women and once again molded them into successful graduates. 26 years ago, I was a student speaker at my graduation from my master's program here in Boston. My daughter and wife were there, as was my brother and his family. Two generations. Fast forward to today, and now my son, who was not born at the time, is here with his son, my grandson, Oscar. We're joined today by other friends and family, most notably my mother, who flew in from Jamaica yesterday. So we're four generations strong here today. So, as I thought about what I would say to this group, I tried to harken back to what I said 26 years ago to that graduating class. I said something about stopping wars, ending hunger. I might even have said something about stopping global warming. I was a little ahead of my time. But that speech wasn't very effective. None of those things kind of got fixed. So this time around, though those are laudable goals, I'm going to take a different approach. This time around, I opted for the more practical approach the do, learn, succeed approach, the hands-on approach, the Wentworth approach. This time around, I'm going to speak to you, all of you, as I speak to my grandson, Oscar. I've been fortunate, very fortunate. I run a $2.5 billion corporation with 6,000 employees. We spit off $100 million in cash every three months. I've been very fortunate. There are a few things that I've done over the years to appear to take advantage of the fortune which came my way. And I want to share those with you. I really believe that in the United States of America, everyone is faced with the opportunity for success if properly prepared. As graduates of Wentworth Institute of Technology, you have taken a major step in your preparation for success. You are very fortunate to be graduating today. There are three things I want you and Oscar to remember in order to maximize your good fortune. One, have a plan. Someone said if you don't have a plan, any path will take you there. A plan gives you clarity of choice. When faced with a fork in the road, and there will be forks, it will provide you with a path forward. I often have young people come to me in despair, not sure what to do, adults not sure what the future holds for them. My first question is, and always is, what is your plan? No one can create a plan for you. There are no more guidance counselors. The training wheels are off. What is your plan? Personally, I tend to make five-year plans. Some people make three-year plans. You have to be patient. Success does not come swiftly. It takes dedication and hard work. Today I stand here. I'm in year two of my current five-year plan. You get to choose the end destination. I suggest you choose a plan that leads to happiness. Yes, happiness, not wealth. As I get older and I think about the people I care about, I don't wonder what kind of car they're driving, how big their house may be. I wonder about their happiness. I wonder if my friends and family are happy. As you get older, you do realize that's the most important goal. So you need a plan that you're willing to sacrifice for. Work hard to attain. Yes, I use the word sacrifice. Bit of a downer today, but with, with age, you realize that most things worth accomplishing take sacrifice. Being in Silicon Valley, I get people come to me with business ideas, startup ideas all the time. If the idea is to make a lot of money, you may as well buy a lottery ticket. If the idea is to solve a problem that is hard, to passionately, tirelessly work seven days a week, 
at a concept you deep, deeply believe in, that is a plan. If you're passionate about the goal, monetary reward is an ancillary benefit. Important, but not the most important reward. Your feeling of accomplishment and heightened self-worth is much more important and fulfilling. I'll spend a little more time on the technical side. Plans that technical entrepreneurs would have. You need a plan. You must be flexible with a plan. If facts change, you have to change. First idea usually is not the most successful. The derivative ideas tend to be the ones most successful. The 3M post-it glue. Everyone knows the little 3M yellow stickers. It was an accident in the lab. A glob of sticky material that did not leave behind a residue. They found a use for it. They did not go into the lab that morning trying to make post-it pads. They weren't even trying to make glue. The iPad was not optimized initially for video. Now video is the most important app on tablets. The first iPads did not support the most popular video formats. Google was a better way of chronicling data sites on the Stanford campus. They did not wake up one morning in sunny California and say, let us be billionaires and do no evil. They were trying to solve a technical problem. You have to be willing to adapt your plan and review your plan frequently. Probably the most important attribute any entrepreneur has is being flexible. As the facts change, you must change. The worst thing you can do is try to bend the facts to fit your plan. Most people change careers three or four times in their lifetime. Those are radical plan shifts. Be prepared for them. Facebooks and Googles are rare. About one in 50 startups get funded. About one in 20 are successful. At that high a failure rate, learning from your failure is very important. It will serve you well in your next venture. In a limited partner, I'm a limited partner in three venture firms, so I see a good amount of deal flows. We actually look for entrepreneurs who have experience in startups, even if they had failed. We expect that you've learned from your failure, learn how to better budget, manage people, manage projects. Given the same idea, we would prefer an experienced entrepreneur who has failed and learned to one who has never done a startup. Learn how your idea doesn't have to be original. Original ideas are very hard to find. Because it has been done does not mean it cannot be done better. As a matter of fact, with time, it is almost guaranteed to be able to be done better. Before Google, there was Yahoo. Before Facebook, there was MySpace. The Apple mobile phone operating system had the entire market for smartphones. Now, three years later, they're number two behind the Android operating system, which was created by 20 engineers in a garage. The experience you gain in a failed enterprise can be invaluable, as I said. But to recap, most venture-backed firms fail, most original ideas are not the successful ones, and the most successful entrepreneurs had success in their second or third venture, not their first. Moral of the story, if your plan is to be an entrepreneur, Financial success cannot be your only reward. You have to enjoy the journey and learn and grow from the path you take. Second, choose your friends and mentors carefully. With plan in hand, run it by friends, mentors, and family members. People whom you trust, who care about you, who will tell you the truth even though it hurts. I remember watching a, a show where contestants were in a singing competition. This one guy was very bad. I was deservedly dropped from the contest. He could not carry a note if we were in a grocery bag. He couldn't sing. Outside, he and his friends and family were outraged. They took umbrage to the fact that he was bounced from the show. I thought to myself, did they really think he could sing? Moral of the story, if your plan is to be a singer, don't ask a group of tone-deaf people if you can sing. Run your plan by people who understand the market, people who know your capabilities, People whose input you can trust. Once, executing against your plan, work hard. This is your plan, your path to success. If you're not willing to work hard and sacrifice for it, then you probably will not get much from it. More importantly, if you're not willing to work hard at it and sacrifice for it, people are not going to work hard and sacrifice for you and with you. People are always watching. You should always be watching also. You should be watching to learn from other successes and mistakes. My first engineering mentor was Ed Kramer. 
I was in co-op from Wentworth. He taught me to be a good engineer. He taught me missteps to avoid. He reinforced what my own father taught me, an old carpenter saying, measure twice, cut once. He took me under his wing because he said he liked my work ethic. I was the first one in in the morning, last one to leave, never late. I took the hard projects. I was inquisitive. I wanted to learn. He and I would share a single tea bag. He'd dip it into his hot water. Before it changed color, he'd put it into my, my tea, tea cup. People made fun of us. The tea was free. Why are you guys sharing a tea bag? I asked Ed eventually why he did that. Ed rolled up his sleeves and showed me the numbers in his arm. He was in a German concentration camp. Hundreds would share one tea bag. He could not drink tea if the water color changed. So here I am, a 20 year old from Jamaica, and my mentor is a Jewish concentration camp survivor. Moral of the story, your mentors can come in all shapes, sizes, and colors. But you have to show them that you're passionate about what you're doing, that you are willing to work hard, and that you care. If you do that, people will help you. They will mentor you. If you're the office prankster, the life of the party, don't be surprised if you don't get the right people wanting to help you. Aristotle said, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence, then, is not an act, but a habit. Excellence, then, is not an act, but a habit. If you carry yourselves with dignity and grace and work hard, people will take notice. The right people will take notice. By the way, if you want to see dignity and grace with hard work and action, look no further than to my right at Dean Driscoll. I will always be his student. He'll always be my professor. Thank you for what you taught me. Thank you. Third, be mindful of your dignitary signature. Your dignitary signature means more to you than the name on your diploma. There are two components to that. Your social media profile and your credit score. I know. Social media, Facebook, tweeting, et al. If you think your mother or your grandchild would be embarrassed to know you did something or see you doing something, do not put it on social media. Assume it will be there forever and accessible by all. You can see some of you reaching for your smartphones and delete buttons now. Too late. There is no delete button. Remember that. Every tweet, Facebook picture is archived somewhere. Those companies value those archives and your data more than you do. There is no delete button. Back to choosing friends. With a young man, who had an 8 o'clock interview for us in my prior company. And his friend called about 8.15 to say that our Canada family emergency, he had to reschedule. We had a young assistant in HR, and she thought it strange. So we got this app that we run, it's a social media crawling app. And we ran it against his friend's name. Not the candidate, the friend's name. Lo and behold, posting a friend's Facebook page at 4 AM was our candidate, drunk and Harlem shaking. And the parents won't know what Harlem shaking is, but <laughs> you can fill them in later. Um, needless to say, we didn't hire that person. And it wasn't even his Facebook that caused the problem. It's his friend. His friend showed the video of him out at 4 o'clock in the morning drunk, saying he won't be able to make the 8 o'clock interview, and tagged him to the video. So, moral of the story. You have to be mindful not just of your social media profile, but of those people you associate with. Okay, now to another uplifting, uplifting topic, your credit score. One of the biggest impediments to success, guard it carefully. Eight times out of 10, when someone comes to me and they have financial problems, their credit score is already a disaster. Your credit score determines the cost of everything that's important to you, from your mobile phone to your mortgage. You could drive the same car, have the same phone, live in a similar home to your neighbor, and your cost be thousands more per year, the difference being your credit score. There are jobs you cannot qualify for if you have poor credit score. I had a VP we were interviewing for, and he needed security clearance, and he was not qualified because he had a poor credit score. 
Why? Because the U.S. government deemed him a risk to accept bribes from foreign entities. That's a quote. So that credit score means a lot. Another suggestion, do not co-sign anything unless you're willing to assume that person's debt. The person you're co-signing for can't afford the item they're buying or has such poor credit score they can't buy it on their own. Now I didn't say don't co-sign anything. I said don't co-sign anything unless you're willing to assume that person's debt. In the default, the collection agency will look at the credit scores of all the signers. Your friend with a credit score of minus 500 won't even get a call. You with a perfect credit score, they'll be all over you like a bug on a windshield. So, with your newfound job, new credit card, go out and treat yourself. Take mom and dad out to dinner, pick up the tab. Then pull out your plan. Your plan will help you decide what you need versus what you want. You need a reliable car to get to work? Use Toyota fits the plan. New BMW? Not so much. One you need, one you want. My guidance is pay cash for as much as possible. Only thing you should buy in credit is something you really need, not something you want. You went to an engineering school. Do the math. Monthly costs for a used Toyota, insurance, everything included, versus hot sports car with five-year loan. After five years, you probably have enough for the down payment in the condo or to start that business that's a part of your business plan. Any paycheck where you do not at least save a dollar, pay yourself a dollar, is a paycheck where you paid everyone else. The bank, credit card company, phone company, cable company, they're all paid. What about you? So some commencement speech, huh? I have you sacrificing, working hard, buying parents dinner, saving money, doing derivatives and math, all in one speech. Well, what I really want you to remember is just those three things. Have a plan. Choose your friends and mentors carefully and protect your digital signature. Just three things. Lastly, I would say to Oscar, you're the citizen of a country that elected a black man of mixed heritage named Barack Hussein Obama president. I've traveled the world many times over. There is no other country in the world where that would be possible. Not the UK, not Germany, not China, not Japan, not Kenya. Whatever your politics, no other country would that be possible in. If you have a plan, work hard, sacrifice, choose your friends and mentors carefully, are mindful of your digital signature, you can achieve more, have more of a global impact, be happier here in the United States of America than any other country in the world. Good luck. Take your place with the other fortunate people in this country with an advanced degree. Make the most of your good fortune. Congratulations to the class of 2013, and I hope your plans bring you happiness. I just presented the medallion, uh, the Institute medallion to Mr. Carney. I want to thank him for the outstanding speech. It was done in the Wentworth tradition of being very practical. And as an immigrant, I do agree with Mr. Carney that the US is still the best country in the world and the land of limited, unlimited opportunities. So as Mr. Carney said, take advantage of those opportunities. And now would uh, our chairman, Michael Anthony, come up here to recognize our commencement speaker with an honorary degree. Could you do the hooding? Yeah. Madam President, I have the honor to present Lloyd Carney 
for Wentworth's honorary degree. And let me read the citation. Lloyd Carney, today, Wentworth Institute of Technology honors you for your industry leadership, the contributions you have made to your profession, and the, the work you do in support of entrepreneurs. Your expertise, strategic thinking, and vision in data, data networking and technology have set you apart as a true industry leader, business executive, and innovator. You have built and expanded markets and played key roles at industry-leading companies. You are a champion for entrepreneurship and recognize its importance for developing ideas and growing businesses. You clearly reinforce the essence of a Wentworth education to do, learn, succeed. Wentworth is proud to have one of our own graduates be recognized for their support of the Institute. Lord Carney, for your industry expertise, the inspiration you offer to entrepreneurs, and the leadership role you play in growing markets and industries, Wentworth is proud to honor you with the degree of Doctor of Engineering Technology Honoris Causa. So I would like to now recognize Dr. Carney's family and give them a big round of applause. <laughs> 